buildings. This is, in here, is a courthouse on international war crimes. And over here is the Nederlands Congress Centrum, where 10,000 or so delegates are meeting to discuss an international war crime, an international crime of warlike implications. The destruction of the planet posed by climate change is enormous and unprecedented. And inside this building, delegates from over 100 countries are coming together to talk about the problem and sort of kind of consider possibly maybe some interim, you know, long-term solutions. The wording for all that kind of stuff. And then just in front is the, uh, the sandbag. Sand. This country is built on it. And sandbags and the dikes keep the water out. One of the big dangers of climate change is rising sea level. Palau has several, well, 300 and some islands, but um, seven of them are heavily inhabited. And each, each of the seven are connected by causeways. And the causeways were originally built that even at high tide, it's still way above sea level. And now, at high tide, the sea is coming over the causeway. When it goes bad, the little guys always feel it first. And we are, as you know, the little guys, right? And we will feel it first. We are feeling it. As we speak, we said, our industries are being eroded. Our aquifers are becoming saline. In the communities, people are saying, you know, how come the water is rising so much more? You know, how come the droughts, you know? I mean, two years ago, we had droughts in Palau where the trees and stuff were spontaneously catching on fire, and yet we didn't have um, the structure to deal with that. But if the increase in emissions has gone up by some 11% since 1990, and we should have been down 5%, as I said, we were 16% in the wrong direction. That can't be good news for anyone. The, the negotiations right now are pretty sensitive, you know, with Canada and the United States and Japan coming in with the, their requirements. But I think, you know, they, they are listening to us, us much more so than before, only because now, you know, what's happening environmentally is nipping at their heels. talking about planting trees you know and there's some there's some of the things are even saying uh, people are coming along saying there's this forest and it would have been cut down I mean we were we were all set to log it we won't if you give us carbon credits because we're stopping carbon emissions it's bullshit you know I mean I, I won't shoot you so will you give me some money you know they're trying to turn it the whole thing's turned into a trade fair you know it's all oh how can we make money out of this will nuclear power be one of them we're fairly confident that nuclear will. There are many developing countries who recognize their need to provide electricity for their people. Those would include China, um, some of the other Asian nations. They're looking to use all of the technologies effectively. But even more importantly, America's been the technology leader in this area for decades. And there's no reason for us not to apply that good old American know-how in figuring out how to deal with this problem. The U.S. is trying to fuck over our world. They don't care about the environment, they care about cost-effective measures. That's pretty much it. It hasn't even been finalized in any sort of, in the Kyoto Protocol whatsoever at this point, but they're already looking at how to make a profit off of what should be an a ethical move to improve the climate of the world, to keep it from getting worse, to keep polar ice caps from melting, sea island states from being flooded. We're embarrassed of our nation for failing to act now on issues that will be pertinent for years and years to come and anyone who tries to tell us that clean energy is not economically feasible at this time basically just does not know what they're talking about. The U.S. Reduces, produces the most amount of greenhouse gas emissions yet we refuse to take leadership and in, in, in take uh, responsibility for the pollution we've released. The richest nation in the world, if there's anyone that can afford to cut back and start making changes, 
it's us. But we're not seeing that here today. What we're seeing is corporate power. We're seeing lobby interests uh, taking precedence over people's interests. We better not resort to using carbon sinks because scientifically they won't work. And we really think that our delegation is short-sighted and not listening to what their people want. Imagine being bikeless in the Netherlands. Instead, we're stuck in this taxi stand with 15 idling cars at a conference on climate change. The ice pack is thinning. The polar bears are in trouble. Work it out. Potential for solar is huge, even in a cloudy country like mine, the UK. If we put every available roof with solar panels on, we could generate far more electricity than we currently use. And, you know, we use electricity very profligately, profligately in the UK, just as pretty much everyone does. There's a lot of hand-wringing. How can we possibly address climate change? It's, it's going to be expensive. It's going to destroy the economy. What do you say to those kind of comments? Well, they're all true, and there's a disconnect. I mean, those of us who've been choking on our frustration and working on this process for 10 years, uh, I mean, you know, it, it's, there's something that's almost surreal about it. It would be hilarious if it wasn't so tragic. We know now that the, the, we're talking about the future of, of our species and the environment in any way that we know it today. And yet we also know we've got to achieve deep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions. We've got to knock out fossil fuels. All these thousands of people are talking about is whether or not they can or can't begin a very small process of incremental cuts at the top of the range of where we have to ultimately get. I mean, our society has evolved and can evolve towards something else, but right now we depend so much of this intense source of energy of that uh, if you just make an 80 degrees turn, everybody will fall off. Many people, including the Europeans, see you as part of the villains of this conference, you being the Canadian government. There's nothing about being a villain. Uh, it's a question of whether we want to get an agreement or not. You have to have agreements. You have to have provinces on side. You have to have industry on side. You have to have the players on side. You can't do it. The federal government doesn't do it by itself. It's got to be a broad national effort. Like how, how could you possibly get consensus amongst the oil companies and the people impacted and governments from 160 different countries? You can't. It may come down to a choice between big business and the climate. And I'm wondering if, if you have that choice, if it boils down to that, which would you choose? We uh, I think we reject the premise of the question. I think that if the Americans say they can do it, then the Europeans, maybe some other countries, are going to do something. What they're going to do is something very protectionist, I think. Thank you so much. Good luck. And also good luck to the guys out there because they're cold outside and they want the same thing as you want. We had been told yesterday it was okay to have this demonstration. And then this morning the police showed up. They have horses, motorcycles, riot police, and they're telling us that if we move, they'll arrest us. They cannot march to uh, the embassies that are supporting nuclear power in the climate change conference. And frankly, it's just completely outrageous. Yes, then Hague is underwater. We will only see jellyfishes and sea monsters and medusas here, and not people and grass and all this stuff because everything is underwater because of climate change. Here we are, 200 students from America, and we can't even go see our country's representation in this country. There's a good representation of those people who do want to march, though, for those people who would get arrested by doing something like this. Is the march going to go over? Yes. Was it a consensus decision reached? No. There's some group, some people, Greenpeace are marching, some people aren't marching. I'm marching solidarity, all the Europeans are going to march.
everybody. We're all fucked. And now people will be taken away, being denied the right to have their voice held. Yet, only a few kilometres away, in the conference centre in Den Haag, you actually have world leaders, politicians, ministers, talking about public participation. This is public participation when it comes to nuclear power and climate change. You know, obviously, something has gone wrong. You know, the, the, the call hasn't been heard. And uh, that's, a, that's a shame. I mean, at the Institute, we would have liked to have seen the, the protocol ratified and, and acted on, you know, as, as early and as quickly as possible. I mean, it's, it's a small step in, in the right direction. And it doesn't even look like we're going to do that. Oh, I think it would be a, a huge disappointment uh, all over the world, I suppose, uh, that politicians couldn't uh, couldn't actually uh, make a deal and uh, make uh, the rules operational in order to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. So, of course, we will all be very uh, disappointed. Canada is the worst country here at The Hague. My country! is the worst country here. I'm 45 years old. My name is Tuker Gomberg. And I've carried a passport all my adult life, proud of my country. Tonight I'm ashamed. The Canadian delegation should go home. Get on the next plane and get out of here. Because you're not helping the climate and you're not helping the planet. Go home, Mr. Axworthy. Go home.